Matthew 28, this is an amazing scripture and I'm just going to briefly look at it. And uh, he said to them, you know, they were, some were doubtful, it said, some worshipped him and some were doubtful. And uh, Jesus basically just ignored that. He didn't say, you know what, guys, you just really need to get your act together, you know, no more doubting. No. What does he say? (laughs) All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Now, Tiana read it. She read the NIV. This is New American. And it says, therefore, go, which is kind of interesting because it does give a different slant on it a little bit, the two different versions. And make disciples. Now... It's actually what I want you, what I want us to see is making disciples is the goal, okay? Making disciples here is the goal. This is what this scripture is about, all right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching to follow his commands, all right? So going, baptizing, and teachings are the means of attaining that goal, All right, so that's what this is talking about here. So what does that mean to us? What does it mean to you? All right, what does it mean to you? I want you to think about this. What does it mean to you to make disciples? What does it mean to you that the scripture says that we are to do this? This is a command. This is not, oh, well, if you've got nothing else to do between, you know, 1st of September and the 25th of September, I'd like you to go out and make some disciples. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's actually a command. It's an imperative that we are to make disciples, you and me. So what does that mean? Well, what is a disciple? Generally, people say, oh, it's somebody who sits under somebody who's teaching them about Jesus. Well, yeah, that's true. That is true. What else is it? Well, you've got to go to the word. So we're going to go to the word. Luke 14, 26. I want to read this to you. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that's not my words. That's the words of Jesus. He cannot be my disciple. So we've got to hate everybody. Does that sound like Jesus? Some people are looking very nervous. Okay, so what is, what is he doing? He's using a comparison, isn't he? Why is he using that very, very strong comparison, right? Because, you know, our family is their closest to us. They're the ones we love more than anything, right? And here he is telling us to hate them. But what is he saying? What is he saying? I want you to think about that. What is he saying? All right, so he's saying, if you want to be my disciples, this is what you have to do, okay? I want you to to listen to this. This is Luke 9, 59, and, and he said, this is Jesus, to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Hmm. And Jesus said, hmm. Let the be- dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Wow, pretty serious stuff, isn't it? What is God saying? Then he says in Matthew, he says, Do not think I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I want you to think about this. What is Jesus saying? The story of Isaac and Abraham, what did, what did God say to Abraham? Go and sacrifice your son. Not something you hear every day, is it? Why? <laughs> what was it about the relationship between Abraham and Isaac that made God say this? There had to be an issue, didn't there, that Isaac was just taking up too much of the heart and God was getting pushed out there a little bit right of course he he, you know God didn't expect him to sacrifice him but he was testing Abraham wasn't he all right we know the story we all know that as he prepared to do it God said no 
right? And he gave him the sacrifice to worship with. Now, I had to, when I was studying this, I had to ask the question, is there an Isaac in my life? And I want you to ask yourself that question right now. Is there an Isaac in your life? The Lord asked me, is there an Isaac in your life? And will you dedicate your Isaac to me? Cost of discipleship, right? A disciple is someone who lo loves God more than anyone else. That's what this is saying. This is the requirement. Like, I love my family. I die for my family, seriously. But, my, but God, my relationship with God comes first. But, you know, people say to me, oh, but, you know, it's, it, it, you know it's my family is so important. Yes, they are, they are important. And God's not saying that they aren't important. But he is saying that I need to come first. And you know what? When he is your priority, everything else falls into line. He makes everything else work. Like the fact that I'm able to come here and visit my family as much as I can when I earn nothing, I don't get paid to do what I do, and yet I come through this country sometimes two or three times a year and my family in Australia because he's my priority, you see. And he makes everything else happen. All right? Okay. Requirement number two. That's just number one. <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? Requirement number two, Luke 14, 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What does he say? What did the cross mean to Jesus? Death. So, but you know what? We have become such a self-obsessed society. It's all about me now, me. If it doesn't suit me today, you know, oh, oh no, I don't think I can do that. I've got to, you know, whatever. There's more books today sold than the Bible. The Bible used to be the most sold book in the world. Now it's books about help. How can I help me? Self-possession, right? Jesus didn't say that we need to love ourselves. He knows that we love ourselves because we take care of ourselves. We have to deny ourselves, okay? So salvation, we come to Christ. We come to the cross and we receive forgiveness. Discipleship means carrying one's own cross. And that means dying daily, right? So what's the positive outcome of denying yourself? Right? In Luke 9, 24, it says, this is Jesus' words, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Let me read that again. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. It's powerful, isn't it? Bearing our cross means dying to ourself. So why did he use this radical situation? Why did he say this? Right? And I kind of like to think about it, that in every Christian's heart there's a cross and a throne, and the Christian is on the throne. It still puts himself on the cross. Right? Am I on the cross? In my life, or is Jesus on, on the throne? I mean, am I on the throne, or is Jesus on the throne in my life? We want to be saved, but we insist that Jesus does all the dying. <laughs> okay, we need to dethrone ourselves. Number three. So I'm going to kind of put number three and four together. Luke 14, 28, and verse 33. So... <coughs> Jesus underlines the importance of counting the cost. You know, like people rush into things all the time. People do, you know, go to the store and buy, you know, overbuy and then go home and think, what was I thinking? You know, why did I buy this? You know, we rush into things, we impulse buying, right? People rush into marriage, people rush into careers. Sadly, sometimes people do the same with their commitment. They haven't really sat down and understood what it means to follow Jesus, that they're going to have to give up 
And I think in all the evangelism I've done throughout the world, this is the one factor, the thing that holds people back often is the fear of giving up. What do they have to give up to come to Jesus? Right? Fear of the unknown. And so I say to them, you know, there's nothing in the Bible about life's going to be easy after you get saved. <laughs> there just isn't. Right? But you have to make a commitment to follow Jesus. And the thing is, we don't have to do it on our own. That's what we're going to talk about shortly. All right. So, likewise, uh, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciples. So we cannot be not his disciples if we don't forsake everything. So I want you to think about the young man who came along and said, what do I have to do, Jesus? And he said, follow the commandments. And he said, well, I already do that. You know, I, I honour my father and mother and so and so and so and so. He said, but I want you to sell everything. Sell all your possessions and then come and give them away. And he said, no, I can't do that. All right? Now, he missed the point, didn't he? Why did he miss the point? Well, I shared this story this morning. When I was, I was living in Sweden for a few years, travelling backwards and forwards and having a place to go back to, it was really nice. But <coughs> I arrived with two suitcases and after some, I've been there a couple of years, I got back from a trip and I looked around the apartment and I'm like, where did all this stuff come from? You know, and I'm sitting I'm going, oh my gosh, it was really frightened me. And I said to the Lord, I sat down and I said, Lord, I said, is this a problem? I arrived here with two suitcases, now I've somehow filled an apartment. And he said to me, he said, if I ask you to give it up, would you? And I said, well, of course. And he said, well, then it's not a problem. You see? And so... This is what the, the rich young ruler, he missed this point. You see, God is not saying, I want you to live in poverty. He's just saying, I don't want that to be the most important thing. If God asks us to give up our possessions, are we willing to do that for him? Right? Are we willing to? Counting the cost. We have to forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, you know, we can't do it on our own. We have to, uh, I could not do what I do if I had to rely on myself. You know, when I got saved, Jesus came into my life, right? And we say this thing about I got Jesus in my heart. You know, that's actually not scriptural. You know, There's nothing in the Bible about Jesus being in my heart, you know. But he certainly comes in. Holy Spirit comes into your life. All right? Now, then, so you have, you have the Holy Spirit and your life changes. But then it's said in that scripture that Tiana read that we're to baptize people. We're to teach them. So we're to teach what he's taught us. And we're to baptize these people that have come to know Jesus and we are trying to disciple so what does that mean, baptizing? Well, I, know, I don't know if you still do it here now, but I know they used to do baptism by immersion. You still do that? Uh, baptism by immersion. That happened for me when I first joined YWAM, and it was in a creek, actually. It was supposed to be a river. It was more like a creek because it was, um, what do you call it? Drought <laughs> in Australia. And, um, you know, they, we had to get down on our knees virtually and then they pushed us under. <laughs> but it was interesting because that was something I chose to do. That was like a statement for me. And when I came up out of that water, I really did feel like a different person. I felt like a, just so much had been washed off me. But spiritually, I knew that I was still needed something. And so I was reading books and reading books. And I read this book by an Englishman, uh, Colin Urquhart, When the Spirit Comes. And that, he, the Lord opened my eyes because I read that. I knelt by my bed and I said, I don't understand it, but I want it. And God <laughs> baptized me in the Spirit. And that was a very real experience, a very real experience. You know, I don't know if you've ever, if you, you know, what your experience has been as a Christian, but I've had some very interesting ones over the years and some very hairy ones. But when people talk about being baptised in the Spirit, 
what does that mean? Well, it's, what it means is that it's scriptural, number one. Okay, it's not something to be afraid of, being baptised in the Spirit. It's something that God wants for us. And according to Scripture, it, it says that we are to receive the Spirit and we will, what comes with the Spirit is power. The power of the Spirit. I want to read just briefly this couple of Scriptures here. And this is Jesus and he's resurrected. But he says to them, he talks to them in Luke, that he would, he says, it is written that the Christ, that's him of course, would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations. That's what we're to be a part of, right? Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. The promise of my Father. Isn't that so, it just so blesses me. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And you are, and you're to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. And I just love this because that's what it does. It clothes you in power. All right. So then we have 1.8. And this is when uh, he's called all the disciples together or, and he tells them that they're to wait until the Spirit comes. In verse 8, he says, I want you to wait. Receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. So, these things go together. This waiting, right, to receive from God the power of the Holy Spirit right, be baptised in the Holy Spirit and we are to, God is growing us. I mean, he teaches them right up until he, he it says he, he was taken up into heaven. I mean, he was so amazing, Jesus, that he taught right up until the time he was taken. And then he said, I'm going to send a gift. The Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to continue that teaching with you. And it's so incredible. So when I received that baptism in the Spirit, it turned my life around. I mean, I, wanted, I felt like I was hanging from the chandeliers. I mean, I spent entire afternoon, I started to tell you this and then went off on a rabbit trail. I, I spent all afternoon, and I don't know if you've ever heard, drunk in the Spirit. Some people may have heard this expression, drunk in the Spirit. Trust me, I was drunk in the Spirit. And it's not the funny time. I, I just, I, I, I'm like one of these people, you know when you're working on the computer and things stall and, the, and you hit refresh? I love that refresh. Ting! It refreshes. It's amazing. And that's what it's like for me with the Holy Spirit. I receive that initial baptism in the Spirit and then every day, several times a day sometimes, I'm like, oh, Lord, I need you. Just come. And I just sense his Spirit coming into me. He gives me the power to do what I do. He wants to give us, everyone, the power to do what he's calling you to do. And that is to make disciples by going, teaching and baptising. It's a pretty big responsibility, isn't it? But you know, he trusts us to do that. That's the most amazing thing. That It, it blows my mind that he actually trusts us to do that. All right? We are to be imitators of the Lord individually and as a church. Imitate him. That's what we're to do. See why every, every uh, disciple is a believer. Not every believer is necessarily a disciple. And I'm aware of that. And some people, they, it's not for me. And, and I, I'm okay. That's okay. You, you're still saved. You're still going to go to heaven. But I'll tell you something. When you, when you are able to do this, to become a real disciple of Jesus, your life changes. It changes. And the way you talk to people changes. When you embrace the Holy Spirit, when you allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, it changes you. All right? <coughs> when he says clothed with power, 
It literally is being clothed with power. Okay, so salvation is free. Did anyone pay anything for salvation? No? Okay, I see some smiles. Right? But discipleship costs everything we have. And that's the choice that you have to make. Are you, do you want to pay the cost? Do you want to give your life to Jesus in this way to become a disciple so that you have to give up, that he's your priority, that you understand the cost, right? That you, you are prepared to die daily. You don't just die once. You know, Jesus did that and it was amazing. However, we aren't God. We have to do it daily. We have to die so that we're not obsessed with ourselves. Yeah? Okay. I just want us to take a few moments. And I want to just, I want to give you the opportunity of just, just going to close our eyes and just ask God, what does he want from you? What does he want Maybe you've already made up your mind. No, this is not for me. Well, maybe ask the Lord. Maybe ask him, Lord, do you want me to be a disciple? Let me just pray for you and then we'll just take a moment. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here today. We're so very grateful for all that you do in our lives, even if we don't recognize it, Lord, and acknowledge it and Show our gratefulness to you. Lord, we thank you for this word that, that you want us to make disciples, Lord. But we need to understand if this is what you're asking us to do, we need to understand what a disciple is. We ask for your help here, Lord. Help us to change our hearts. Help us to make that step, Lord, to, to embrace your word and the requirements for us to be disciples because we believe your word we believe this is your word to us god so lord speak to us now holy spirit come just show us our hearts thank you jesus